Drones began to fly to the high tower on the flying island from all over the city. Inside the tower, in the monastery of fire, human screams were heard. The dragon crushed the last survivor with its paw, pressing a hole in the floor through which the body fell. The body was impaled on the peak of a statue located on the floor below. The drones captured his death, informing everyone that the Lord of Swords, Lucas, had fallen. The entire team was exterminated. Stage 127 failed. The remaining health of the boss of the Abode of Fire, the Dark Dragon of Death, was 94%. The decimated crew, who had recently announced their participation in the trial by fire challenge with smiles on their faces, now lay dead among the rubble of the House of Fire. Viewers who saw their death live were surprised at their defeat, as they were the strongest team but managed to take down only 5% of the dragon's health. Viewers began to wonder if anyone could defeat this monster. They shouldn't have reached this stage at all. Some viewers asked for help, some mourned them, and others questioned how such a boss could be defeated. Everyone received a notification that the boss needed to be destroyed before the end of the period. 32 minutes and 20 seconds left. If they failed, the population of the area under examination, the solar system, would be destroyed. People stood on the city streets and watched everything on screens displayed on tall buildings. Someone asked, is the world really ending? Another suggested attacking the monster with the whole crowd. Someone replied that there weren't many adventurers left. One man had already come to terms with his speedy death and decided to order a farewell dinner with all his money. Another person in the crowd said he didn't want to die, but then a new notification came. A new member had arrived. The 128th participant, named Ray Indo, entered the abode of fire through the portal. The audience was glad that some team had not yet given up and hoped that they would win. One of the spectators asked, But weren't all the teams already dead? There was only one member on the team, and as soon as he took his first steps into the monastery, drones circled around him. Seeing one person, a spectator said they had better say goodbye to their loved ones. He probably just decided to kill himself gracefully as a farewell. The dragon noticed him and narrowed his eyes slightly, asking if he came alone. The dragon said he didn't want to prolong his agony, so he shouldn't defend himself in vain, granting him three whole minutes of life. Re raised his head, laughed lightly, and with a smirk, called the dragon a coward and thanked him for his advice. The longer he chatted with him, the longer he would live. Did he really value life so much? The smile on his face grew wider, and he said he was so touched he was in tears. The dragon, angered by his words, laughed and said he seemed to hasten his death. He opened his mouth wide, and a clot of fire began to gather inside, quickly growing in size. The system reported this as a dragon flame, an area attack skill. Re was unafraid when he saw the bright flame. Hiding his hand behind his back, he snapped his fingers and summoned a magic ball. Then he asked, the first attack and immediately across the area, correct? Immediately after, the dragon attacked and there was a loud explosion. Re said it was dangerous to attack so suddenly. The dragon released the remnants of the flame from his mouth, surprised that Ri was still alive. Ri showed a sparkling magic ball with a smile, and the dragon said this couldn't be happening. How did he parry the blow? The magic ball above Ri's hand began to grow, and he replied that he didn't come empty-handed. Now the dragon would receive a blow back. With a smile, Ri extended one hand forward, and a green stream burst from the magic ball, taking the form of a dragon. This stream swirled around the Dark Dragon of Death and then sank its teeth into its belly. The system reported that the Dark Dragon of Death had 84% of its health remaining. Blood oozed from the dragon's wound, and Re asked if the main skill of the great and terrible dragon only dealt 10% damage. He dispelled the magic ball over his hand and said in disappointment that he had prepared in vain. The dragon, catching his breath after the recent pain, wanted to say something but Re interrupted him. Taking out a crystal wrapped in a chain from under his clothes, he said that after this, even the number of spectators might decrease. With a smile, he divided the crystal into several parts, revealing a small skull inside. He told the dragon he shouldn't have opened his mouth. The system reported that he used a unique item, the shackles of the soul. The upper part of the crystal appeared above the dragon, 
and it began to be wrapped in chains from all sides. The dragon, not knowing what to do, was nailed to the ground with a roar. The chains finally bound him, causing him to growl loudly. Re raised one hand, summoning smoke and sparks above his head, and told the dragon to sit quietly and watch. The dragon's body trembled, and he did not answer. A nearby drone focused on Re, who grabbed a sign and stuck the base into the floor. The sign displayed details for transferring payment to his bank account. The drone flew closer, showing the audience the sign, while another drone circled around. There were 22 minutes and 52 seconds left before destruction, but Re was in no hurry to kill the dragon. He said he would wait another two minutes. Grabbing the drone, he said that if they wanted him to kill the dragon, they should transfer the money to his account. He leaned his elbow on the sign, standing against the backdrop of the dragon, and pointed the camera at himself, asking with a grin how much they thought their lives were worth. He snapped his fingers and sat down in the chair he had summoned, waiting. The audience asked if he was crazy, and urged him to finish off the dragon since the whole world was at stake. Money was not that important. Re poured himself some tea, and the dragon exclaimed if he was also demanding payment in such a situation, asking if he had any shame at all. Re yawned and snapped his fingers, tightening the chains on the dragon's body even more. The dragon got angry and said Re would pay for his bullying. Violet flames began to gather inside the dragon's mouth, and a red warning appeared. The Dark Dragon of Death had activated its ultimate skill, Flame of Great Rage. The dragon opened its mouth wider and released a bright stream of flame at Ree, but he didn't even pay attention to it, taking a sip of tea. The barrier behind him protected him. The dragon's eyes widened in surprise. Ree, putting his cup of tea on a saucer, said the dragon was not learning anything. The unprotected area behind him was burned to the ground, and Ree asked if he had not told him to sit quietly. Otherwise, the sign with his account number wouldn't be visible. The dragon, in shock, couldn't believe his ultimate skill didn't work. Re scrolled through the history of incoming transfers on his phone and remarked that only 10 billion had been transferred to him. Are they laughing at me? He asked. I don't even know if I can do the job properly for that kind of money. He leaned back, looking into the drone's camera, lazily waved his hand, and said goodbye. After that, the live broadcast was interrupted, and everyone froze in shock in front of a huge screen displaying the word error. After a minute of silence, the crowd roared indignantly. A man asked, does he need to transfer all his savings? What kind of farewell was that? Why did he interrupt the broadcast? A woman, holding a child in her arms, fell to her knees and asked, is this the savior of the world? Horrible. Everyone on the streets began begging for his help, and people from high circles became nervous. While following the boss down the corridor, a man told him that if they paid the full amount, they would suffer big losses in the future. The boss shouted in response, You unfortunate idiot! We'll think about that later. We can also become his sponsors. Transfer everything we have to him. After that, an amount of 10 trillion yen was credited to Ri's account. Rising from his chair, he said, I have finally received as much as I wanted. I am now the richest man in the world. He entered the system space, activated his side skill, the blacksmith of souls, and said with a grin, now it's time to save the world. He snapped his fingers and took a vial containing the soul of a type A mage, the soul of a type B dragon, and the soul of a god of the same type. The system reported that the formation of special equipment had begun. The holy sword of the great artisan appeared in front of Ri. Then he left the system space and approached the dragon, which had already begun to break free from the chains. The dragon laughed and asked, Are you crazy? Are you going to defeat me with this toothpick? He grabbed the chains, stood up suddenly, and broke them, screaming, You're finished. I will kill you with my own hands. Before he could finish speaking, Ri cut off one of his paws, which fell to the floor with a crash. The dragon growled in pain as Ri jumped up, swung his sword several times, first cutting off the dragon's head, then slicing his neck into several pieces, and finally proceeding to the body. Soon, he landed on the ground, and behind him, the dragon's body began to fall in pieces. Ri raised the sword, swung it to shake off the blood, and said, Your death was already a foregone conclusion. 
He wiped the blood from his face with a grin and said, This happened the moment a substantial amount came into my account. But how did Riando get to this point? Some time ago, it was a sunny day. The wind rushed into the small room where Ri was playing a game using a virtual reality device, sweating profusely from the heat and effort. A bright notification from the system popped up in front of him, congratulating him on successfully passing the last test. Ri fell to one knee from fatigue and asked with a smile of disbelief, Did I really pull it off? Scam game was the common name given to one fully immersive game. Prophecy Online This game had excellent VR world development, fully immersive action, and 16K resolution. Using a VR device, the player could sense sounds, smells, and objects. It was an online RPG with an open world. Its description stated that those who complete the game to the end would gain unlimited access to resources that do not deplete even after centuries. But no one believed the description of the game. Ri was one of those who simply played and had fun. They said it would be better if the reward was transferred to his account. But one day, everything changed. He remembered how one fine day he was working at a construction site. The foreman announced a break, and the workers went for a snack with smiles. Ree sat on a bench under a canopy, hiding from the heat and listening to the conversation of other workers. They said they would clear away construction waste until nightfall. He worked hard at a construction site as usual, but he couldn't get a normal job, so he started working as a laborer. He was squeezed as if in a vice. He worked until exhaustion in the hot sun, and from his colleagues, he received only mockery and ridicule. When he opened his food container and started to snack, he received a message from Prophecy Online on his phone. He looked at the notification and wondered, Is this a letter from the developer? But I turned off all notifications. In the letter, Ri was named the top first player and congratulated for reaching first place in the power ranking among all beta players. The reward would be sent to his account so they asked him to confirm the transfer. They wholeheartedly wished him success in Prophecy Online. Ri unscrewed the cap of his water bottle and thought with a grin, What is this? Have they become email scammers now? He checked it right away. He logged into his account and, starting to drink water, said that his account was still empty. But suddenly, he fell silent. When he saw his balance, he was very surprised. Seeing the amount of 1,335 yen, he loudly exclaimed, What is this? While he was looking at the phone screen in shock, one of the workers called out to him and asked, Hey, I wanted to ask you something. Not hearing an answer, the worker walked up to him and touched his shoulder, asking, What's wrong with you? Overheated or what? Ri quickly jumped up from his seat, pushed the worker, and ran from the construction site. The worker fell and asked, Where are you going? He called out to him several times. But Ree did not pay attention. He ran home with a smile, thinking, Can I really make money in this game? If those words about unlimited access to resources that will not expire after centuries are true, then he devoted all his energy to the game. But he realized too late that he was too naive. This game was merciless to the players. They were like pawns on a chessboard. Level bosses destroyed not only players, but also their saves. Dungeon exits always appeared in different places. But the most important thing was that they felt every blow in the game in reality. When players encountered too realistic pain, they developed a fear of death and stopped playing. From his job, he earned just enough to cover only the most basic needs. To continue playing, he went into debt and took out loans. Soon, money lenders began knocking on his door but he had no choice but to move forward in the hope of unlimited access to resources that would not expire even after centuries. Now, when he had just completed the game, he again received a message from the developer congratulating him on completing the game. The experience he gained would undoubtedly remain a valuable resource in the future. Re caught his breath and took off the VR device, placing it on the floor with trembling hands. He said with a smile, I really did it. A notification sound rang out, and he immediately rushed to the phone. He received an email from the developer of Prophecy Online. He excitedly clicked on the notification and saw what was in the email. The message was addressed to all Prophecy Online players. Not long ago, they achieved their goal. Someone had finally completed the game. Therefore, all game servers would be disabled from now on. Re asked, what about the reward? In the last line of the letter, 
the developer thanked all players for their support and participation. Without seeing even a hint about the reward, Re let go of the phone in shock and its screen broke. He lowered his head dejectedly and asked, What about my reward? I beat the game after all. They should reward me, right? He convinced himself that there was so much money that they couldn't transfer it all at once. He went to his mattress and lay down, saying hopefully that he would check the account tomorrow. But since he received the first million yen, no more money had come. He kept thinking how much better his life would be if he had left everything halfway, but no matter how much he regretted it, time couldn't be returned. A week passed. Re woke up on a hot morning and heard notification sounds through the whirring of the fan. He asked, What is going on so early in the morning? He took the phone and made sure that no one seemed to have called him. He looked in the direction where the sound came from and saw a screen in front of him that said the main quest and the ice test stage had failed. Moscow was destroyed. The main quest of testing the earth was beginning. Remaining time, 43 days, 7 hours, and 58 minutes. Let them destroy the boss before the end of the period. If they fail, the area being tested will be destroyed. After looking at several screens that popped up at once, he asked in confusion, What is this? Meanwhile, on TV, the news showed that Moscow had been wiped off the face of the earth. A satellite image was also attached, showing that the city center was completely burned out. The reporter, Hayes, who was at the scene, asked if they saw it. Moscow no longer existed. The entire city had been reduced to dust. The Russian government said there was no chance of survival left. Moreover, unknown creatures suddenly appeared on the territory. Cities seemed to be under attack by something resembling dragons. A helicopter with a team from the Japanese media flew over the destroyed Moscow. Hayes said that the horror that happened to Moscow now awaited Japan. According to their viewers, this disaster was similar to a quest in a certain game called Prophecy Online. The similarity was almost 100%. Ray was surprised when he heard the words about the game. A geologist invited to the news channel did not believe the report and said the video was falsified. All destruction was caused by a natural disaster due to the shift of tectonic plates. His colleague objected that their reporter was broadcasting from the scene, but the geologist did not let him finish and said he did not know what kind of monsters there were. This was most likely interference from the camera. Meanwhile, the monster under the helicopter began to collect energy in its mouth. Joss nervously asked if they were safe, noting that the creature had been looking in their direction for too long. You won't aim it at them, will you? Seeing this, her colleague told them to urgently fly out of there, asking if they could hear him. Let them get out of there now. After that, the live broadcast was interrupted, and he looked at the screen in shock, calling out to her and asking her to answer. After watching the news, Rhi said, These are not lies. I am sure of it. There is no doubt. He began to get dressed and get ready to go out. Although the world found itself in a terrible situation when the game became a reality, he was absolutely calm because then only one thought was spinning in his head. The rest of the people received the same notifications and hesitantly began to master the system, pressing different buttons. When Ri wanted to leave his house, he looked at the task window in front of him. There were 43 days, 7 hours, and 54 minutes left until the end of the earth test. Test location, Japan. Progress, 0%. Ri was calm because of the thought that the experience he received would undoubtedly become a valuable resource in the future. These resources implied strategies for completing the game. He was the only one who went through it to the end, and the salvation of the world was in his hands. He turned the doorknob, swung the door open, and walked confidently out into the street. He thought that with this unproduced power, he would certainly make a lot of money. He ran through the streets of the city, thinking that since Prophecy Online had become a reality, a race for points would now begin among former players he needed to run to the nearest dungeon. With the onset of the apocalypse, the atmosphere on the streets became gloomy. As he ran past people, he could hear them wondering, is Japan really over? We need to run quickly, but where? No transport works anymore. Ray was already starting to get tired and gritted his teeth, but suddenly, the familiar voice of a lone shark named Takuo called out to him, calling him a brat and ordering him to stop. Ray stopped, seeing a familiar face in front of him. The moneylender, lighting a cigarette, asked displeased, 
Does that mean you ignore us but go for a walk? Ray caught his breath after running and thought, It's Takuo from the Lone Sharks. Takuo threw a cigarette, but in his direction, and said he was just on his way to visit him. Turn around and go home. The cigarette but hit Ray right in the face and left a mark on his cheek, but he didn't respond. A year ago, while he was in the game, he received a letter saying that their company was offering players an interest-free 200,000 yen, but only for those who qualified. Let them enjoy the game. Don't concentrate on work. Conditions. Players who receive unlimited resources undertake to give half of them to us. Then Ray was happy and thought, as much as 200,000 without interest? I can give it back later when I finish the game? Seeing such supposedly good conditions, he agreed. But of course, in reality, everything turned out quite differently. They actually gave him 200,000 yen. But then, after he had already spent it, they sent him a contract with exorbitant interest rates. According to them, he did not pass the selection. So they demanded 50% after 10 days. He met with loan sharks, but they threatened him with a gun. So he had to take out several loans to pay on time. However, when he was ready to pay everything on time, they did not answer the calls. They waited for the interest to rise. While Ri was remembering this, Takuo asked with a grin, It's time for you to give us our money, right? Ri clenched his teeth and said displeased, You didn't give me a chance to return them on time. Takuo asked, Are you serious? All debtors usually say such excuses. You're just a pathetic brat. He came closer and said that actually, that's not what he was here for. You played Prophecy Online, right? Ri became wary, and the money lender said that the state of the world now is just like in a game. He walked up to him and abruptly grabbed him by the clothes, shouting, you know something, right? Let it all out. Ray's face darkened, and after a short pause, he told him to take his hands off him. The veins on Takuo's face bulged with anger, and he asked, Did you forget who you're talking to? Ri said he would give him one very important piece of advice. After that, he activated the beginner's fist skill. When the money lender saw his hand shining blue, he let go of him in fear. The system reported that his impact force had increased by 50%. Ri quickly punched the money lender several times, causing blood to spray from his mouth, and he fell, hitting a road sign. Ri approached him and deactivated the skill, saying, In this world, I am in charge. Takuo remained silent, and Ri said that he didn't seem to hear him anymore. He ran on, leaving the money lender unconscious. People driving by in their cars became interested in the spectacle. A guy in a hood named Light rolled down his window, and a girl named Ryo, sitting next to him, asked, Is this a game skill? Light did not answer but grinned, thinking he didn't expect to meet and initiate so soon. Soon all laws will turn into nothing, and the whole basis of the world will be rewritten. He laughed quietly, thinking the situation was getting more and more curious. Soon, Ri arrived at the entrance to the goat sanctuary and approached the huge doors. He had no doubt this place was exactly the same as in the game. Coming closer, he stopped and noticed a parked car on the road nearby. He wondered if there was already someone inside. He entered the sanctuary and descended a long road for several minutes. Approaching the entrance to the first hall, he suspected something was wrong. Smelling blood, he immediately covered his nose. Inside the hall, he saw a pile of corpses of lizard-like humanoids on the floor. In the center of the hall stood a team led by Light. Light noticed Ri and told the others to look. Another one had arrived. He placed both hands on the hilt of the sword plunged into the monster's head and asked, If he got here, does that mean he's also a player? Ri asked displeased, Were they the boss here? Light confirmed and said that these high-level monsters were called Shining Lizards. If it weren't for them, I would already be dead he added. Ri thought, are these high-level lizards? They are the lowest in rank. He took off his hood and, with a smile, said, as I see it, you came alone. This means you have no friends. How about becoming my subordinate? I will give you half of my rewards, and in return, I, the strongest, will protect you, the weakest. The faces of his team members showed different emotions. Ri closed his eyes and apologized saying he preferred playing solo. He pointed his finger at them with a smile and said, Besides, you don't have a single chance against the boss. Light's face darkened with irritation, 
and the others were surprised by his words. They went behind a column and quietly discussed what to do with him. Light suggested finishing him off after they dealt with the boss. Rumi asked if he was serious, saying it was too much. Light replied that all remaining players were obstacles in their path. The fewer people know about the game, the better off we are, he said, pointing his thumb down. That's my decision, and anyone who disagrees will die by accident. The team members became nervous and remained silent, not daring to object. Then he said that the boss of the level, the Fire Goat, was a difficult opponent. After victory, he recovers after seven whole days. We can't let that guy get loot from the boss too, he added. The system reported that there were five minutes left before the doors opened. Soon, the doors would open and they would enter the room with the boss. Re, who was standing away from everyone, was approached by several team members, including the magician Rumi and a swordsman named Yuji. Re looked at them with a grin and asked, What is it? Did you decide to fight me? Yuji clenched his fists and, with Rumi, said, It is so. Don't move. Re remained silent, thinking he could teach them a lesson but didn't even want to get his hands dirty. Finally, time began to run out and they went up the stairs to the door. Looking back at Ri, he remained in the hall and watched them with a smile, thinking he would still have time to kill the boss when they lost. Time ran out, and the doors opened. The team went inside, and Ri stayed outside, leaning against the wall and sipping his tea. He grinned, wondering how far they could go. Ri, meanwhile, asked worriedly, did he not follow them? Light smiled and said that this only made them feel better. She asked, but what if they realize we made his death look like an accident? He told her not to worry about it. She was thinking too much. During this conversation, they almost reached the end of the spacious corridor. Light, hitting the guy's shield with his fist, told him to be on guard. The guy showed him a thumbs up with a smile and said, As long as I have a shield with an epic level engraving, no boss is afraid of us. You can count on me. Suddenly, a strong wind blew through the corridor and Light exclaimed, What the hell? Where does this wind come from? At the end of the corridor, a huge column of flame flared up, emanating wind and heat. Light froze in place, looking at the flames in horror, thinking this was the appearance of the boss. The flames finally dissipated, and the clatter of the monster's four hooves was heard. A huge centaur with a hammer appeared before them, and they all realized the boss, the hellish goat, had arrived. The goat bleated loudly, and flames burst from its mouth. It swung its hammer in a circle, throwing all team members in different directions. There was a loud scream, and a powerful wind rose, causing them to fly even further. Some were thrown straight to the doors, including Light. They were covered with the shadow of the hellish goat. Looking up at it, Light thought, This is very bad. What should we do now? The girl who fell next to him got up and asked, What should we do now? Light waved his hand and ordered everyone to be silent, saying they were retreating immediately. A man who had already tried to open the door said, The door won't open. From the side, a guy with a shield asked, What the hell are you doing? Light looked towards the team members running towards them from the other end of the corridor and told them to hold their position. He called out to the guy with the shield, Your shield can withstand anything, right? The guy got nervous and wanted to object, but Light interrupted him, saying, Since you said so, act. The rest of the team ran to the door while the guy stood up to protect them. The hellish goat raised its hammer over its head and slowly approached him, trampling the corpses of his comrades. The monster began to attack, and the guy, looking at him with horror, did not dare to move. The hellish goat hit him with the hammer causing floor fragments to fly in all directions and dust to rise. Hearing the crash, Rumi and Yuji turned around, their faces frozen in horror at the sight of their comrade's crushed body in the impact's depression. The hellish goat snatched the shield from the corpse's hands, raised it above its head, and chewed it with a crunching sound. The team members were amazed, and one of them asked, Did he chew through the epic shield? Light, in shock, said, He is a monster. This shouldn't have happened. They were preparing to meet the fire goat. Even beginners could defeat this monster with the right strategy. But after the new version, a boss appeared that no one could defeat. One hellish goat, 
and all 4,762 players failed to kill the boss. Light gritted his teeth and trembled in fear, thinking, I shouldn't be here. Why wasn't it removed? Suddenly, Light remembered Ree, who was standing outside, and thought that although the doors couldn't be opened from the inside, Ree could still get in from the outside. He ran to the door and started banging on it with his fists, calling out to the black-haired guy and asking him to open the door. He promised to give Ree all the rewards for defeating the monster. He stopped knocking and listened, but no one answered. He screamed again, asking if Ree could hear him and begging him to open the door. While he was screaming, a hammer flashed behind him and hit him. The monster was already at the door and scattered everyone to the sides with its hammer. They fell to the floor, wheezing in pain from the impact. Light tried to get up, and looking up at the monster, said that it was too strong and they were all going to die at this rate. At that moment, Ree opened the doors and walked inside, saying, It's so rude for a leader to beg for help from others, don't you think? He looked at Light writhing in pain with a smug smile. Light clenched his teeth, thinking Ree was an idiot, and decided he would use him as bait to escape. He rose to his feet and told everyone else to head out, saying he would distract the monster. All the surviving team members ran to the door, but when Rumi ran past Ri, he advised her not to do this and tripped her, causing her to fall. She sobbed in pain as Ri slowly walked towards the monster. Noticing something to the side, Ri stopped. Light ran with all his might to the door, but it had already begun to close. Stretching his hand forward, he thought about himself and was almost on the other side of the door, but it closed right in his face, squeezing his hand. Feeling the pain, he screamed loudly and leaned his foot on the door, trying to pull his hand out, but he couldn't. The hellish goat approached him and said he was too noisy. Light immediately fell silent as the monster swung his hammer, saying irritably that Light's screams were making his ears ache and he should finally shut up. Light, with fear in his eyes and cold sweat on his face, heard the sound of an impact. His body was crushed and blood splattered everywhere. Rumi and Yuji, sitting nearby on the floor, looked on in horror, asking what they should do now. Ri picked up Light's sword from the floor and asked, Don't you know? Everything is very simple. He extended his hand with the sword upward and, examining the blade, said that although Light was an idiot, his sword was not bad. The hellish goat raised its hammer over Ri and laughingly asked if he also wanted death, saying he would help him with that. The monster struck with the hammer where Ri should have been, but Ri was already above the monster's head. Grinning, he said the monster was really talking nonsense. He then cut off the goat's horns and, moving down its body, began delivering cutting blows. The monster screamed loudly, and its horns loudly fell to the ground. Ri found himself next to the surviving team members. He called out to them causing Rumi to jump back in fear with tears in her eyes and Yuji to become wary. Ri threw the sword over his shoulder and, with a smile, said he would save them for 10 million yen. How do you like this offer? Rumi couldn't believe her ears, looking at him in shock, and asked again, 10 million yen? Ri confirmed her words and said, yes, 10 million each for saving your lives. Yuji, annoyed, told him not to talk nonsense asking where they would get that much money. Rumi agreed, exclaiming that it was too much. Ri pointed the sword at them and said that if they didn't have money, they should earn it with their own labor. You don't want to die so early, do you? He suggested they give him 90% of the reward from every boss they defeat, saying he thought about asking for full payment, but decided they could take 10% for themselves. I'm not a despot, he added. Rumi indignantly told him not to fool around and Yuji exclaimed that even with light, they gave him only 50% of the spoils. Ri asked if they were refusing. Immediately after his words, the shadow of the monster covered them, and a stream of flame flashed over their heads. The hellish goat, gathering flames in its mouth, called Ri a mortal and said he dared to deprive him of his pride, his horns. You will pay for it now, the monster declared, releasing a huge fireball in their direction. They didn't even have time to leave the line of fire. Rumi quickly took out her staff and defended herself with a barrier, but it was difficult for her. Ri jumped, dodging, while Rumi and Yuji fell to the side, screaming. Thanks to her shield, they survived. 
With a trembling hand, Rumi grabbed the shoulder she had fallen on, re-landed next to them, and said they survived. It was close. He wondered how long their luck would last. Rumi nervously said she would agree to anything, even if Ri just killed the monster. Yuji got excited and said he also agreed. Hearing their answer, Ri grinned and said they agreed. He turned to the monster, still surrounded by flames, and said he hadn't beaten him for a long time. Hearing this, the hellish goat looked down at him and asked how long it had been, saying he didn't remember ever losing to a mortal. Yuji was surprised and asked what kind of nonsense Ri was talking about. Rumi said that with the new hellish goat update, no players had managed to defeat it. Ri looked at the monster with a confident look and thought there was no update related to this boss in the game. After his victory over the hellish goat, it changed its form and players could only fight against the fire goat. While he was thinking about this, the hellish goat attacked him, but Ri immediately reacted and deflected the blow, causing the hammer to miss. The hellish goat did not expect this and asked in surprise how Ri was able to fend off his hammer, wondering who he was. Ri ran to him and said that such an attack would be fatal for a level 50 veteran player, but as long as he knew the monster's weakness, it wouldn't kill him. The hellish goat gritted his teeth in rage and swung his hammer. Ri dodged, moving to the side at the last moment. The monster exclaimed, asking why he couldn't even hit him. Thus, Ri approached the monster's head and, cutting its eye, said he was not cheating himself and was moving exactly as in their last battle. Moving around the monster, he continued to strike its body while Rumi and Yuji watched. Yuji clenched his hand into a fist and, with a smile, shouted at Ri to continue, telling him to kill the goat. Ri didn't like his support and irritably told him to shut up, to which Yuji responded by exclaiming Ri was so rude. Ri landed and the monster's hammer came close, hitting the floor and destroying it. After that, the hellish goat hit the hammer again and said Ri was just very dexterous, that's all. Ri managed to survive, but as he dodged, he hit the wall and was pinned in the corner. He said he was pinned against the wall. The hellish goat approached him, placing the hammer on the floor with a menacing look, and asked if Ri had anything to say in the end. Ri told him to go to hell, and said the monster wouldn't hit him even at that distance. The hellish goat flared with rage and said he understood. Raising his head, the monster opened its mouth wide, accumulating hot flames inside. The fire started to spread around. Rumi said it was so hot in there, and Yuji asked what the monster was doing. Ri thought it was a flame that destroyed everything in its path, thinking even level 99 players could not survive such an attack. Attack there is nowhere to hide from this attack, no matter how hard they try. This is his most important trump card. Ri's eyes lit up in anticipation as he said, This is wonderful. This is what I was waiting for. He crouched down, and the system reported that the beginner's kick skill was activated, increasing the power of his kick attack by 50%. He pushed off the ground and rushed upward with such force that the floor broke beneath his feet. Pushing off from the wall and the monster's hammer, he reached the ceiling and thought that the flame destroying everything in its path was a powerful spell, but at the moment of casting it, the boss was absolutely defenseless. The boss was so focused on the spell that he couldn't even move. Ri turned overhead, then touched his feet to the ceiling. Pushing off from it, he rushed toward the monster, pointing the tip of his sword downward, thinking that even a first-level player like him could slam it with one precise blow to the head. As expected, Ri stabbed his sword into the head of the hell goat, causing it to immediately fall and break the floor with its weight. The monster no longer moved, and small flames burst out of its mouth. Ri said that once the monster began to cast the flame that destroys everything in its path, it couldn't interrupt the spell. In this state, its flames would simply eat away all its insides. As soon as he said this, the body of the hellish goat became charred, and flames began to escape from all its openings. Ri pushed off the hilt of the sword and jumped, asking if the monster could survive its own flames. Finding himself high above the monster, he saw its body turning even blacker as the flames intensified. He smiled slightly and said goodbye to the goat. After that, he landed on the floor, and the hellish goat behind him instantly burst into flames and screamed heartrendingly. After the flames died down and the burnt body fell, they approached the corpse, 
and the system reported that the unique boss Hellgoat had been defeated. Yuji breathed a sigh of relief and said, Thank God we're saved. Rumi covered her mouth in shock, saying she couldn't believe it. She looked at the imperturbable Ri and said that he defeated the boss without receiving a single injury. After that, a message popped up in front of Ri, saying that he was the first in the whole world to manage to kill a unique boss. For this, he was awarded a unique title, Novice Conqueror. Ri became interested and said there were no such titles in the game. Still, the world and the game are different in some ways, he mused. The title description stated that the unique title increased his attack power by 50% when attacking bosses. Ri was surprised and repeated, 50%? That sounds too cool. The system reported that since he was the first in the whole world to be granted a unique title, as a bonus for such an achievement, he could choose a subclass for himself. Ri was again surprised and asked, Was this a choice at the very beginning? That's too generous. The system asked if he wanted to choose a subclass right now. Ri asked, What kind of question is this? He pressed the yes button and said the answer was obvious. After that, he found himself in another space and the system informed him that after selecting a subclass, it would be impossible to change it. Re touched the panel in front of him, and sparks began to emanate from it. In his thoughts, he said that he needed a soulsmith. Waves began to emanate from his hand across the panel. Then a bright flash appeared, and sparks swirled around him. That's how he received his subclass. The system congratulated him, stating that the soulsmith subclass was now available to him. Re grinned and said he was hunting for money and had hit the jackpot. He decided to see what the monster had dropped. A key and a dagger appeared in the air above him. Rumi asked, Is that the key to underground waters? These are special hunting grounds where you can not only improve your skills but also make good money. Yuji frowned and said that according to Light, this was a very rare item for which he assembled the group. Re spun the key on his finger. After a short pause, replied, this thing is not that rare. The drop rate of this key is 100%. Rumi, confused, said he spoke so confidently. Yuji got angry and exclaimed, How do you even know this? Ri did not answer and, showing them the dagger, said, This hellish dagger is really a rare thing. He aimed at the nearest debris, lightly touched it, and swinging down, seemed to cut the stone. Rumi, in shock, asked, What did you just do? Did you cut the stone like butter? Ri calmly replied, This is still too weak a result. He opened the system window and thought that this was where he would test his new class. He hoped he had enough materials to improve it. A subclass, as the name suggests, is an additional class to an existing one. Most of these subclasses are useless, except for a couple of rare ones. The soulsmith is one of them. People with this subclass are able to extract a fragment of the soul from all things people, animals, plants, and ore. Different fragments give different improvements. With the help of this subclass, it is possible to beat this stupid game. He activated the eye of the soul, and when his eye glowed blue, he looked closely at the blade. The system reported that the item could be awakened using the soulsmith subclass, requiring an F-rank mage soul fragment. He turned his gaze to Rumi, who was discussing something with Yuji at the time, and thought that she seemed to have a magic class. With the help of the Eye of the Soul, he learned her name and that she had reached the fifth level. To remove the soul, she needed to sign a contract. He thought about the contract and considered asking them for 90% of every boss they defeated, but that seemed too ambitious. Instead, he stabbed the blade into the floor, walked up to them, and showed the key, asking if they wanted to become stronger. He offered to give them the key in exchange for something. Yugi eagerly replied that they did. But Rumi, wary, asked if it was a joke. He showed them the contract and said they must promise to bring him all the items on a list, which he would consider as an advance payment. Yuji took the key with tears in his eyes, expressing that they were fortunate. He believed it would make them rich. Rumi was also touched by his kindness and thanked him with a smile. Ri told them not to thank him because the richer they became, the richer he would become. The system reported that he had entered into a contract with Rumi, and all conditions for extracting the soul fragment were fulfilled. A flask appeared above his hand, drawing out the fragment of the soul. When it was complete, the lid took the shape of a large hat. 
The system reported that a fragment of the soul of an F-rank magician had been received. Re exclaimed that the materials had been collected, and now he could begin forging. He activated the soulsmith skill, and the fragment of the magician's soul and the dagger began to swirl in a whirlpool, merging together. Re raised his hands, looked at the blade above him, and commanded it to wake up. A bright flash followed, and an updated hellish dagger with a glowing edge emerged. The dagger fell into his hands, and the system reported that the awakening was successful. The attack power had increased, and a new skill, Soul Slash, was available. He wanted to test his new skill and swung the dagger, causing Yuji and Rumi to instinctively step aside. Ri then swung the dagger again, releasing a powerful shockwave that reached the end of the corridor and beyond, breaking through the sanctuary wall. The loud noise sent all the birds in the area flying away, and sunlight streamed into the sanctuary, illuminating the surprised faces of Yuji and Rumi. Ri looked up at the sky through the hole he had made, and small pieces of debris fell from the ceiling. Rumi hiccuped in fear, and Yugi asked in shock if it was possible for a person to have such power. Having tested the force of the blow, Ri said it wasn't bad. He had weapons and skills, but there was only one thing left. After saying this, he turned to Rumi, who was very scared. She closed her eyes and covered her head with her hands, silently pleading for her life. But he simply walked past her and approached the wreckage. Rumi, surprised, turned around and saw him kneeling next to a corpse with his hands folded in prayer. Her eyes sparkled with admiration, thinking he was honoring the memory of the deceased players. However, his intentions were far from noble. After his prayer, Ri cleaned out the pockets of the corpse, found a wallet, and began counting the money, claiming it as his own. He thought to himself that it would definitely be enough for a taxi. Yuji commented that he was worse than the Hell Goat, a monster in human form, and Rumi, equally shocked, agreed. Time passed, and Ri headed to his next destination, arriving at the entrance of an abandoned temple. Inside, he walked forward until he came across a well. He climbed inside and started descending the stairs, thinking that at the bottom was a secret dungeon where he could easily farm experience. The monsters were strong, but now that he had awakened the dagger, all the experience and money would be his. A few minutes later, he reached the bottom, and as soon as his foot touched the ground, a gold coin flew towards him. Noticing it, he immediately swung his dagger, cutting the coin in half. He then took a fighting stance as the two halves of the coin fell behind him. Seeing those who had thrown the coin, he became wary. A group of three people approached, and the leader, named Cookie, smiled and said there were new faces here. His expression then turned menacing as he declared that Ri had entered their territory. Ri pointed his dagger in their direction and asked why on earth this was their territory. Cookie asked if he knew the rules. The early bird gets the worm, right? Ri replied that if they had a group of three, he could show them some great areas to gain experience, but it would cost them. A guy named Ion replied that they were happy where they were. His friend Adrian added that Ri needed to pay them if he wanted to pass through without any problems. Understanding their scheme, Ri realized these were the entrepreneurs of this world. He asked how much they charged for passage. Cookie held up five fingers and said it was 50,000 yen per hour. There were many monsters ahead, and if Ri defeated them, he could get his money back. Ri handed over the bills and agreed, saying he would quickly make up for what he spent. Cookie replied that Ri had the place to himself for exactly one hour. They let him pass without further issues, and he soon found himself in a cave filled with crystals. It was a wolf's lair. Hearing a loud roar, Ri immediately stopped and turned in the direction of the sound. The steps of animals could be heard as a pack of wolves surrounded him from all sides, howling loudly. He noticed one wolf baring its teeth and identified it as a diamond wolf an average-level monster with low health. Looking around the cave, Ri wondered if an entire pack had come running towards him. Of course, he could use Soul Slash, but he decided to save his strength. Suddenly, all the wolves roared, signaling the start of the attack. They jumped at him from the stones, but as they approached, Ri swiftly cut off their heads, limbs, and anything else that came near him. After defeating the attacking wolves, he moved on to the next group. When the area was finally cleared, he sat down on a stone to rest. He took out a tea bag, smiled, 
and said that now he could refresh himself. His throat was dry. Sticking a straw into the bag, he began to drink. But at that moment, Adrian appeared behind him and swung his weapon, just as Adrian was about to strike. Re threw the tea aside and blocked the blow with his dagger. Gripping the weapon more securely, Re then swung it, causing Adrian to lean back, trying to dodge. Re's blow reached the ceiling, and a roar echoed as they distanced themselves from each other. Several small pieces of debris fell from the ceiling, and a fresh cut on Adrian's forehead began to bleed. Adrian smiled widely, saying that Re had almost cut him, while Re remained silent thinking that Adrian must have fought against people before. He asked, Did you really decide to attack me from behind while I was distracted by the monsters? Isn't that too low? Adrian flexed his fists and replied, It's much more interesting this way. Re continued, So, you're just holed up in this area, waiting for strong players with decent loot to take out while they try to deal with the monsters, right? The voice of the trio's leader echoed from above, saying, You're quick-witted. He and Ion stepped to the edge of the cliff, revealing themselves to Ree. Looking up at them, Ree remarked, This isn't a wolf's den. It's a gathering of hyenas. I wonder why I'm the only one who thought of coming here, but you should recruit a stronger group. You're unlikely to stand up to me. The smile on Kuki's face disappeared, and he couldn't find anything to say. Ree, observing Adrian closely, thought to himself, When I first met them, I didn't notice it right away. This huge guy here wields a heavy hand weapon. He then turned his gaze to Ion and noted, This little one with the sword adds magic to it, increasing its sharpness. One blow, and he's dead in the grave. Finally, he looked at Kuki and noticed a gold ring on his hand, thinking, The leader's ring is clearly problematic. Kuki smiled and apologized to Ri, saying he would make up for his comrade's mistake. He extended his hand forward, and using the power of his ring, summoned many golden coins that fell to the ground with a clang in front of Ri. Although he kept a calm expression, Ri was shocked in his heart, thinking, wasting money like that is blasphemy. He just threw away 10,000 yen. Kuki grinned and said, it seems I overpaid. Can you pick up the extra and give it to me? Ri looked at the coins and thought, this is an obvious trap? He asked, is this how you compensate victims? Do you force them to kneel and pick up money from the ground? Re realized the nature of the ring Kuki was wearing and thought. These coins could explode at the owner's command. Deciding to play on their greed and ignorance, he tossed his dagger in the air, caught it, and said, If you return my money, so be it. I'll let you out of here unharmed. Kuki and Ion descended toward him and asked if he wasn't at all interested in making friends. Don't forget, Kuki added, the three of us will fight against you. Ri confidently replied, I don't care how many there are, even if it's a hundred. His eyes lit up and his smile widened in anticipation of victory. He continued, Your fighting skills and coins aren't worth it. These words stung Kuki, and he became angry. He extended his hand with the ring forward and ordered the coins to explode. Immediately, the cave was filled with bright flames. Once the explosion subsided, Kuki said he initially thought of just blowing it all up, but now called out to his buddies, telling them to chop this idiot to pieces. Adrian replied that he understood, and then attacked Ri from behind. However, Ri noticed him in time, pulling back just as Adrian's fist hit the ground, scattering fragments of stone. Ri then sensed movement behind him. Ion swung his sword and greeted him with an attack. Ri gritted his teeth in displeasure and parried Ion's strike. But at that same moment, Adrian attacked him with his fists from behind. Re didn't allow them to hit him, and with a circular swing of his dagger, he threw both opponents away from him. They fell to the ground, and Re, displeased, said, I paid you 50,000 yen to leave me alone for an hour, and yet you broke the agreement. Now you're obliged to not only return my money, but also pay extra interest on top. Kuki, using the ring's abilities again, said, Agreed. I'll pay you interest, with explosive coins. He snapped his fingers, triggering a coin explosion with a big smile on his face, and then threw some coins at Ri. As Ri began to evade the small explosions, Ion jumped up and attacked from above. But as soon as Ion got close, Ri deflected his blow, causing Ion's sword blade to break. Ion looked at it in shock. 
Re didn't give him a second to react and swung his dagger, but Ion managed to dodge in time. Kuki grew nervous and thought, did he break Ion's sword? Is his dagger really an epic weapon? Meanwhile, Re attacked his opponents again. Kuki thought, we're much higher in level than him. We definitely won't lose. With this thought, he threw several dozen coins toward Re and immediately triggered an explosion. Gritting his teeth, Re ran away from the explosions, managing to avoid the fire. He then turned around and exclaimed, Who wastes money like that? Are they endless? Adrian, with a wide smile, attacked from behind. Clenching his hand into a fist, he used the missile punch skill and shouted, Take this! A roar echoed from his attack, and a small shockwave passed through, throwing Ion to the side. Ree's dagger flew out of the cloud of dust and fell nearby. Adrian, pleased, said, That was an excellent blow. He'll definitely die from that. Ion, dissatisfied, exclaimed, But did you think about the others? I could have been hurt too. He touched the blade of his broken sword and complained, It'll cost me a lot to repair this. Kuki picked up the dagger from the ground with a smile and said, No matter what weapon he has, it's worthless in the hands of a weakling. So what kind of dagger did he have? At that moment, Ri used the soul capture skill, and chains wrapped around Adrian and Ion's bodies, suspending them above the ground. Kuki looked up at them in fear, and as the chains tightened around his comrades' necks, they screamed loudly. Kuki became very nervous and anxiously called out to them. Ri said that with the soulsmith skill, he could literally squeeze their souls in a vice. A torture far worse than death. Gritting his teeth in rage, Kuki turned around and saw Ri's silhouette among the cloud of dust. He then clutched the dagger tighter and ran toward him. But as soon as he got close, Ri grabbed Kuki's hand and pushed him in the chest with the other. Ri looked him straight in the eye and told him, You're too slow. Kuki frowned and asked, Is that true? With a crazed smile, he grabbed his jacket with both hands and shook it, causing a lot of coins to fall out. He wanted to use his ability and told Ri to try to escape now. But Ri quickly used the soul capture skill, and the chains immediately wrapped around Kuki's body, preventing him from using his ability. The chains then tightened around his neck, and Kuki, panicking, asked why the coin explosion didn't happen. Ri replied, Soul Capture can immobilize the enemy and deactivate their skills if their level is much lower than mine. It's like taking candy right from a child's hand. Kuki exclaimed, Is my level below yours? But I'm at level 7. I'm one of the fastest developing players. Ri, using the chains, lifted Kuki up to join his comrades and said, For a newbie, your progress is indeed good. Kuki grunted in pain as the chains tightened even more. Ri thought, now that they're ready to talk, let's see what they can offer me. Using the eye of the soul, he saw the names of the three guys and what he could take from them. From Adrian, he could take a fragment of the soul of an Efrank fighter, but to do this, he needed to feed him. From Ion, he could take a fragment of the soul of an Efrank warrior, but to do this, he had to reunite him with his younger sister. To take an Efrank soul fragment from Kuki, he had to induce fear that ran through his entire body. Re tightened the chains around Kuki's body even more, thinking, only from him can I get something right. Kuki gritted his teeth and said in pain, please, let us go. We don't want to die. Re picked up his dagger, running his finger along the blade, and replied, you're talking nonsense. What good are you to me alive? Kuki grew nervous and asked what he meant. Re explained, your eyes, blood, organs, I could just cut you up and sell you in parts. He grinned and added, That way, you'd repay the 50,000 yen and cover the interest in an instant. Ion called out to his boss, saying, He's clearly bluffing. He won't really do that to us. Re thought to himself, Of course, I'm bluffing. I need money, but I'm not sure I can even contact sellers for organs. He then asked aloud, But why not? You're not going to give me the money, right? So I'll take it myself. Kuki was terrified and cried out, pleading, Don't be angry. I'll do whatever you ask. Just don't kill us. Thus, Ri instilled the fear of death in Kuki, and a fragment of his soul began to be pulled from his body. The system reported that Kuki was experiencing a fear so deep it penetrated to the bone. 
All conditions for extracting the fragment of the magician's soul had been met. A bottle shaped like a magician appeared in front of Re, and the system notified him that he had received a fragment of an F-rank magician's soul. The chains holding the trio above the ground weakened, and they fell to the floor. No longer feeling the pressure around their necks, they immediately started coughing. Re tossed them a contract with pins and said, Here are the documents. Sign them. All three read the terms and conditions and began to protest. What the hell? 90% of the spoils go to you. This is pure extortion. Re asked threateningly, Do you have a problem with that? They immediately fell silent, nervously exchanging glances, and after a short pause, they replied, Everything's fine. They signed the documents and Re, checking their signatures, said, You're now my obedient employees. Remember, if you dare to break the contract, I'll come and take my share from your bodies anyway. He then asked, Are you working for someone? Give me their contact information. Upon hearing this, they became wary. Kuki asked in a trembling voice, Why do you need that? Re replied, Newbies like you couldn't have such weapons. It means you work for someone who provided you with this equipment. Kuhn's right, isn't he? Kuki fell to his knees in front of Re, grabbing his clothes and begging, Please don't do this. Don't go to him. If the boss finds out we lost, he'll raise us to the ground. Re, displeased, put his foot on Kuki's head and asked, Does this mean you're more afraid of your boss than of having your organs removed without anesthesia? Ion clenched his fist, uncertain whether he was more afraid of Re's words or the thought of contacting their boss. In desperation, he decided to run away, tears streaming down his face as he shouted, I want to live. Adrian called out to him, but Re pointed his finger at Ion and said, So, you decided to choose escape, right? The chains immediately tightened around Ion's neck, suspending him in the air. His friends looked up at him in concern and, stuttering with fear, promised they would do whatever Re wanted. Re then declared, I'm also confiscating your money and weapons. Both Kuki and Adrian exclaimed, What the hell? Ion, still hanging in the air, remained silent as his face slowly turned blue. Re thought, I can't even farm levels in peace without being stabbed in the back. But I don't mind. There's still no one who can compare to me in strength. His status window displayed that he was level 36, a novice class, with 1,017 health units and 1,235 mana units. All his stats ranged from 165 to 194. Night soon fell, and in one of the circus tents, something interesting was happening. Inside were structures for gymnasts and burning rings. In the center of the stage, a guy named Roku was beating a man, slapping him repeatedly until blood sprayed from his wounds, and he eventually collapsed. The people in a nearby cage asked, Is there another one? He was unlucky. Roku dusted off his palms and exclaimed in dissatisfaction, They can't even be trusted with simple work. A smile appeared on his blood-stained face, and he asked, Aren't you ashamed in front of your boss? The man in the cage, worried about the wounded man, told Roku to stop, fearing he might die. Roku turned to him and replied, It doesn't matter to me whether he dies or not. We don't need those who don't benefit the boss. At that moment, their boss, Andre, came out from backstage and asked, What are you saying about me? Hearing his voice, Roku turned around and nervously called out to him. Andre smoothed his hair with a smile and asked, How's the discipline lesson going? He crouched down next to the wounded man, examining him, and told Roku, You got too carried away. What will happen if you really broke a couple of bones? Our guild values everyone, even if they let us down once. They don't deserve to be treated like this. Realizing he was being reprimanded, Roku's hands began to shake, and he apologized to his boss. The wounded man, with a smile and tears in his eyes, looked up at Andre and thanked him, promising to try harder next time. But Andre didn't let him finish. He took the whip from his belt, swung it, and struck the man right in the face, causing blood to spurt from the fresh wounds. He began whipping him on the back, saying, such cattle should be treated like cattle. If the bones are broken, he'll be completely useless, but a good spanking won't harm any animal. With the next swing, he smiled as the man screamed in pain. At that moment, a trio of guys entered the tent, 
called out to the boss and said they had returned. Andre stopped flogging the man and, looking at them with a gloomy expression, said, You're back quickly, Kuki nervously reported. We came to report that, as a group of three, we were unable to complete the task. Andre's gaze fell on Kuki's hand, and noticing the absence of the ring, he looked at it intently. After a short pause, he asked, Where's the ring I loaned you? This ring is much more valuable than your pathetic life. You understand that, right? Kuki flinched at his words, then bowed and apologized, saying excitedly, I understand, but it was taken from me. A man, like a monster, did it. Andre got angry and decided to teach Kuki a lesson by hitting him in the face with a whip. Adrian and Ion were scared, and Kuki fell to the floor from the blow. Andre attacked him, shouting in rage. What the hell is going on in this guild? Why do only incompetent fools work for me? Adrian smiled nervously, and Ion looked away, both silently thinking that it was because all the competent people had left. Andre shouted that someone like Kuki was only good for one job. He called out to Roku, making him flinch, and then threateningly ordered him to let Johnny out. Roku reluctantly released Johnny, a huge white tiger whose every step resounded loudly. Johnny approached Kuki, growling, and then opened his mouth wide, baring his teeth. Kuki became very nervous and asked in a trembling voice, He's not serious, right? It's not my fault. I always follow orders correctly. But Andre didn't care about his words. With a smile, he told Johnny, It's time to eat. Hearing the command, Johnny began to approach Kuki, who screamed loudly, begging the tiger not to do it. The tiger knocked him down and prepared to attack, but at that moment, Re jumped onto a metal crossbar suspended by two ropes and descended toward them. He let go of the crossbar and immediately kicked the tiger, saving Kuki from the beast's grasp. Johnny was thrown aside by the blow and hit the floor. Seeing this, Andre called out worriedly to his pet. Re turned to Andre and, with a smile, apologized, saying, This guy hasn't paid the interest yet, which means he doesn't deserve to die. Kuki was overjoyed to see Re. But Andre ignored him and ran to Johnny, looking worriedly into the tiger's teary eyes and asking, Are you okay? Where does it hurt? Show me. The whole trio, Adrian, Ion, and Kuki, ran up to Re, grabbing him by the shoulders and exclaiming that he was late. They thought they were going to feed the tiger. Re replied that it wasn't easy to get there unnoticed and asked them to finally let him go. As they were chatting, Andre became very angry. He turned towards them waving his whip and raising his hand. But Reed delivered blows so fast they couldn't be seen. He cut Andre's whip into several pieces and then turned to him, waving his dagger. Seeing Reed's power, Andre became nervous and stammered, asking, Who? Who are you? Reed's dagger glowed menacingly, and he replied, I'm your new boss. Roku exclaimed indignantly, Their boss? Have they completely forgotten their place? Have they forgotten all that their boss did for them? Kuki exclaimed that they didn't know anything, and Ion agreed. Saying that they didn't even know how scary Ri was, they couldn't refuse him. Ri frowned and confirmed their words, then pointed towards the cage and told the people that if they agreed to work for him, he would free them from this circus with this clown. The captives looked at him in surprise, and one of the wounded asked, Will you really save us from this hell? Ri grinned and replied, I promise. All you have to do is give me 50% of what you earn, and I'll also give you advice on how to complete this game. Surely that's more profitable than staying with a sadistic clone. The three guys behind him exclaimed indignantly, 50%? He took 90% from us. Re replied, I'd like to remind you that you tried to kill me. All this made Andre even angrier. He said, you hid my little Johnny, and now you plan to take away my workers? His gaze became firm and confident as he declared, I'll send your company straight to the underworld. Re replied, It seems we live in Japan, where slavery was abolished. Why this attitude? Andre took out a golden card and said, Unfortunately for you, I have this. He held up the card, revealing a guild certificate. Guild Master Andre Lukic Kotinko. This document confirms the holder as the head of the guild and provides all necessary authority for administrative duties. 
It was issued by the Director General of the Management Bureau of the Players Association, Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, Kinzo Yamano. Reread the card and asked, What kind of guild certificate is this? Andre explained that the Japanese government had apparently taken what was happening in Moscow very seriously, so it decided to provide guild masters with a document proving their status and strength, which would help them complete this game. He held the card between his fingers with a smile and said, Even the police won't be on your side because I am the law. I might even kill you if it helps me carry out my administrative duties. Re, surprised, said, So, new innovations are appearing in the country. He smiled and added, In short, if I had this certificate, I could create a real empire, pumping out money. Roku, on his knees, handed a machine gun to Andre, who, taking it with a smile, told Re, You're an idiot. To receive a certificate, you must be a player of rank B or higher. He aimed the gun at Re and asked, But what difference does it make if you die here? He opened fire with a wide smile, calling them bugs and saying goodbye. The bullets flew at lightning speed towards Re, but he didn't even move. He took out a fragment of the magician's soul and activated the soul barrier skill, stretching his hand forward to summon a large barrier in front of him, which protected him from the bullets. Soul barrier is a skill available only after level 25. To activate it, you need a fragment of the soul of an F-rank mage. The material is consumed when the skill is activated and absorbs incoming damage depending on the rank of the fragment. Andre, who continued to shoot, asked, Did he put up a barrier? Does he think this will stop me? As he kept shooting, Re said, Even nuclear weapons were launched during the ice challenge, but they didn't work in the end. Re started to approach him and asked, Do you know why players don't attack monsters with guns? Roku covered his ears with his hands as Andre continued to shoot. Seeing Re approach, Andre shouted, Don't come any closer. But Re continued walking and when the barrier touched Andre, he let go of the machine gun. The barrier kept pushing Andre back, no matter how hard he tried to hold it off. Roku decided to quickly leave. Andre clenched his teeth, screamed, and put all his strength into stopping the barrier, but nothing worked. Re took a few more steps forward, and Andre was pressed against the wall, thinking it would crush him. Re came close, and the force of the barrier pressed Andre so hard into the wall that it began to crack. Re walked away, and Andre's body became drenched in sweat as he started coughing up blood. Exhausted, he fell to the floor. Re grinned and said, Remember, skills are the weapons of this age. Your gun can't compare with them. One of the wounded captives asked in surprise, Did he just defeat the boss? Another man in the cage said, I can't believe it. Returned to them and, calling them friends, asked if they were thinking of signing a contract. He added with a grin, I even crushed a clown for your fun. Roku ran up to Andre in concern and helped him up. The people in the cage exclaimed that they hated this freak, demanding to be let out so they could get even with him. They said they would agree to a contract if that happened. Andre argued, It's impossible to conclude contracts with a bunch of people without a guild master's license. The police won't stand aside. Roku became worried about Andre's condition and asked him to calm down. Re replied, Didn't you say they could do whatever they wanted with the cattle? Andre remained silent, lowering his head. Re released the people from the cage, and they immediately approached their offender. Andre and Roku looked up to see a group of angry people ready to tear them apart. After this, loud screams were heard and Re thought to himself that he had gotten himself some labor for next to nothing. He could rely on them for a while. While he was lost in thought, he didn't notice the chaos happening behind him as all the people attacked Roku and Andre at once, venting all their anger, and dust rose from the fight. Re opened the task window, thinking that he needed to take care of pressing matters. Glancing at the remaining time, he thought, Is there only a month left? It's time to go somewhere. Time passed and on a sunny day, Re went to the site of the certified exam at the headquarters of the Players Association. He walked along a crowded street, holding a bottle of his favorite tea. The guys behind him began discussing something, and he paid attention to their conversation. One of them said that players with abilities of rank B and higher could be recruited by the guild, which would generously sponsor them. Imagine an annual salary of 10 million yen, he added. 
His friend told him not to get too carried away by dreams and reminded him that only 1% of all players achieve rank B, with only 9 A-ranked players in all of Japan. The friend happily replied that he would become the 10th, adding that it's still not harmful to dream. Listening to their conversation, Re thought it had already been two weeks since the merger of their world and the world of the game Prophecy Online. Initially, many players decided to accept the challenge from the Japanese government to receive 10 million yen, but the results were disastrous. Everyone died at the hands of monsters. Now, all players were required to register with the association. Without membership, they would not be allowed into the challenge, dungeons, or even receive awards. After replaying the conversation in his head, rethought, they have high ambitions. I wish I had their zeal. As he walked, someone was watching him from the roof. Re noticed the pursuer and immediately threw a road sign at him, which crashed into the pavement with a roar, but missed the target. Re wasn't afraid, but the people around him were visibly nervous. One of them exclaimed, What the hell? Did a road sign just fall from the sky? Taiko's loud voice was heard from the rooftop, calling out to Re, saying he had finally arrived. Re looked up at him, and Taiko shouted with a smile that this time he couldn't hide. Taiko jumped off the roof and landed next to the road sign. Re asked if he had also come to take the exam and reminded him that even with a beginner's skill, he could blow his head off. Taiko beckoned him over and asked if he thought he was still the same weakling. He boasted that he had received a new class, Spearman. Re laughed and repeated, Spearman? Isn't that a class for morons who can't do anything except wave a stick? Taiko was offended by these words and exclaimed, What class do you have then? Re, with a confident smile, replied that he was a beginner in the class. Taiko laughed and asked, Does such a class even exist, or are you deceiving me? Re closed his eyes and replied that he wasn't lying. His main profession was novice. Taiko, holding up the road sign, grinned and said he would believe him but would show him what the spear class was capable of. He used a destruction blow and made several lunges with his spear, leaning slightly to the side. Re easily dodged his blows and began to approach him. Taiko, unable to land a hit, nervously exclaimed, What the hell? Re got very close to him and, with a smile, said that he didn't want to get involved in problems right before the exam, but Taiko had provoked him. After that, Re quickly waved his hand and sent Taiko flying. Taiko didn't even realize it right away, and as soon as he started to fall, he screamed loudly and then hit the ground with a loud sound. Passersby crowded around, some looking at Re in shock. Re, passing by them, said it was self-defense and nothing more. After that, he went to the association, where the girl at the front desk told him the exam fee would be 8,000 yen. Re was surprised at the amount, thinking it was a robbery, but he still had to pay. He sat down and waited, sadly lowering his head. An association worker approached him, apologized for the wait with a smile, and said they were ready to start his exam to obtain a rank. After some time, they came to a huge purple crystal floating in the room. Re thought, so this is the whole point of the test? Do I just need to put my hand on the stone? He hesitantly reached for the crystal, and as soon as his fingers touched it, energy flowed from him into the crystal. Suddenly, the crystal began to emit strong energy, which surprised the girl very much. She asked, What's happening? Due to the energy re-released, the crystal changed its color to bright blue. She looked at what was happening with great surprise and asked, What does this mean? Sometime later, in the office, she slammed her hands on the table and called his name loudly. She said that based on the exam results, they classified his abilities in the A-rank category. She was sure he had already heard about it, but players could also change their classes to Swordmaster, Great Magician, or Archbishop, if he so desired. The association would completely help him in this. Re said he was giving it up. The list of classes she mentioned didn't seem like what he wanted. The girl asked what class he wanted, and he replied that she shouldn't fill her head with unnecessary information. She said that even if he wanted a certain class, without a special subject, he wouldn't be able to change classes, but the association could provide it for him. Re said that if he needed it, he could get it himself. He asked if there was anything else she could tell him. The girl, slightly nervous, asked, Aren't you creating even more difficulties for yourself now? Re sighed and said he didn't know what she was talking about. 
She explained that his strength currently surpassed all A rank holders. People with ranks A to D could change class, but E rank people couldn't. She added that if he refused to enter into a contract and change classes under the new law, he would receive an E rank. Players with this rank faced many restrictions. For example, they couldn't create guilds. By refusing, he was only making things worse for himself. Rhys said it wasn't the first time the government had come up with strange rules. He thought that if he really needed the guild master certificate, he could force one of the workers who had at least a B rank to get it. There was only one class that could complete the final prophecy online test, and until it appeared, he wasn't going to change his profession for the sake of a conventional tick. He asked if even with an E rank, he could still pass the final test and receive 100 million yen from the government. The girl, panicked, agreed, and was about to say something, but Re interrupted her, saying that she could register him as an earache. She understood him and said she would give him a player card with earache. Sometime later, Re walked out into the street, where a large number of players had gathered. People around him were saying that if they had a C rank, they could join their guild. They invited all players from rank D and above to join the Artemis Guild. Re smiled, thinking they weren't wasting time and would do anything to attract talented players. Two girls approached him, saying it was clear from his appearance that he was very strong and asked if he would like to join their guild. Re looked at them and said he was Eric. They were embarrassed and apologized for disturbing him. He continued walking, thinking that as soon as he mentioned his earache, everyone moved away from him as if he were sick. But he didn't intend to work for anyone, so he didn't care. He noticed a person in the crowd whose aura was different from the others. This guy noticed him and started smiling. A man approached Ri, greeted him, and asked, Are you indent? He handed him a small card, saying it was his business card. Ri took the card and saw that it said, Wings of Creation Guild, Shinji. The people standing around pointed at him and said, This is the guy. This is the strongest player from the Wings of Creation Guild, Herd San. Ri asked, Do they call you Herd? Shinji replied, slightly embarrassed, that it was his old nickname from the days of the game. Ri wondered if he was a local celebrity and thought he should probably refuse his offer too. He asked, So, what do you need? At that moment, Taiko loudly exclaimed, This is the Wings of Creation Guild, as he walked through the crowd. He asked if they were really looking for him and if they wanted a peerless B-rank player like him. He was ready to join them for a decent fee. Re noticed him and thought, I've met this idiot again. Wait, he got a B-rank? He must have been threatening the examiner. Shinji, surprised, asked, Who is he? This is the first time I've heard of him. Taiko angrily grabbed Shinji by the tie and said he would show him what he was capable of. But Shinji quickly grabbed Taiko's hand and applied pressure to his shoulder pulling it back forcefully, causing Taiko to feel severe pain. With a frightening look, Shinji told Taiko that he didn't want to waste his time on such people. While the end of existence was approaching, he must be kind and hide from his sight. Taiko, with a dissatisfied expression, said he would remember that even if they crawled to him begging for help, he wouldn't assist them. Shinji apologized for having to witness such an unpleasant scene. Ri replied that Shinji shouldn't apologize because he always appreciated it when idiots were put in their place. Sometime later, they were sitting in a cafe. Shinji asked, So, what did you want? An earank won't be of much use anyway. Shinji explained that Ri only received this rank because he refused to change his class. Ri smiled and said the association was turning out to be more social than he thought. They even told the players about it. Shinji, confused, said his guild was directly connected to the association. Before the end of existence, they must unite for a common goal, even if the information cost a lot of money. He called Ri by name and told him that if he agreed to join the Wings of Creation, they would pay him the same amount they paid the association for providing his personal information. Ri was very surprised when he saw the receipt and wondered, does it say 10 million yen? If he were the same as before, he would have agreed without hesitation. He returned the check, apologized, and said he wasn't very interested in joining the guild. Sido said it was rather rude to offer such talent such a low price. Then he offered information instead, explaining that his guild cooperates with many countries and is considered to have the most extensive database. They would create all the conditions needed and help him find whatever he seeks. 
rethought about this and asked if anyone among their sources had managed to clear prophecy online. Sido laughed and said that no one in the entire world has completed that game. Ray began emitting a dark aura and asked, then how? He immediately refused their offer. Sido was terrified by the strength of Ray's aura. He handed Ray the bill and said that if he changed his mind, he could contact him anytime. He would pay for the coffee himself. As he left the cafe, Sido wondered why Ray had given up so quickly. Approaching the worker behind the cash register, Sido thought he didn't want to pressure him and spoil the guild's image. But that wasn't it. No, it was because he was scared. His instinct screamed at him to run, to avoid angering this beast. Suddenly, Ray approached him quietly, startling him by grabbing his shoulder. Sido turned around, surprised, and saw Ray handing him a piece of paper. Ree smiled and said that if they needed his help, they could call him, and depending on the fee, he might accept a mission from their guild. Sido was confused but agreed and thanked him. He stood there wondering who this man really was. Sometime later, at the headquarters of the Wings of Creation Guild, Sido entered the guild master's office. He informed the guild master that he had returned with a report. The guild master, a woman, turned to him with a smile and asked if he met the strongest newcomer. Sido nodded and replied that Ray was a true monster. His hands trembled as he admitted it was the first time he had met a player who inspired such fear. The guild master began emitting her own aura and asked, Is it he or I who scares you more? Sido was embarrassed and at a loss for words. The guild master picked up a document containing information about Ray and told Sido to pull himself together. I won't kill you, she said. It's obvious. You just told me what you saw with your own eyes. Especially since I'm the most inexperienced of the ten excellent ones, it's not surprising that there are people much stronger than me. This guild master was Yamagata Takino, one of the ten excellent ones, the strongest players in Prophecy Online. These ten players could compete for a reward of 100 million yen in a world where the game had merged with reality. They had gained immense power, and even their presence affected the balance of power between countries. Takino asked, did he reject our offer? Sido confirmed that Ray wasn't interested in their information database or the 10 million yen check. Takino said that if Ray were actually number 10, he might not earn that much money. Sido agreed but wondered why, if Ray really was ranked 10th, he clung to the beginner class. If Ray agreed to rank up, he would gain access to items that enhanced his stats, items not available to ordinary players. Takino smiled and said she appreciated Sido's observation. But if what you say is true, he might not just be one of the ten excellent ones. He could be the unknown number one. Sido was shocked. You mean number one? He asked. Thanks to American intelligence, the nine strongest players had been identified and ranked by strength, but the identity of number one remained a mystery. Some even believed number one didn't exist. Takino explained that there had been rumors that the S-Class intentionally hid number one to keep that power for themselves. Sido admitted he had thought so too, but after meeting Ray, he was convinced Ray could be that number one. Takino stood up from her desk and said that if this were true, they had a good chance of winning. She ordered Sido to relay a message to the guild members. Any aggressive actions toward Ender would be strictly punished. It's better not to cross the dragon's path again, she warned. Sido acknowledged her order with a serious expression. A few days later, Re managed to rent an office in an apartment complex, which became his base. One of his associates called his name, and Re turned around. The associate asked if the TV placement was okay. Re agreed, saying it could stay that way. Kuki, another associate, opened a suitcase filled with money and said it was today's earnings. Re took a stack of bills and said it was excellent. How is group leveling going? he asked. Kuki replied that everything was proceeding according to Ri's recommendations. Teams were farming in the underground, earning 1 million yen per day. Even newbies earned 10,000 yen daily, which was beyond their wildest dreams. All thanks to Ri. Ri reminded them that the richer they became, the richer he became. With this kind of success, maybe you'll even earn a bonus, he said. Kuki thought that even if he gave Ri 90% of what he earned, the bonus would still be substantial. Working in a regular guild, he wouldn't have earned that much in a year. Ri's knowledge of the game was astonishing. Kuki mentioned that there were still 10 days left until the end of the Earth Test, 
and the prize money had increased from 100 million to 400 million yen. Re acknowledged this but said he didn't want to rush things. They turned on the TV, and the news anchor reported that the Earth test was in full swing. If nothing was done, Japan would be destroyed in 10 days. The situation hadn't improved in 47 days. Suddenly, the anchor was handed a document and announced that the Japanese government had issued a message to all players. The reward for completing the Earth test was now 1 billion yen. It seemed the government was desperate, hoping someone could succeed before the end. Reconsidered this and noted that if they delayed further, foreign guilds would flock to claim the reward. He grabbed his jacket and said it was time to save Japan. It's time for me to go, he said with a smile. Kuki, surprised, asked if he planned to go alone. Reconfirmed it, saying he couldn't risk exposing his money hamsters to danger. This touched everyone in the room, and they called out his name. Returned to them with a menacing aura and declared that the billion yen would be his alone. Kuki, confused, asked what his real motive was. Later, at the huge gate where a large crowd had gathered, re approached. Among the crowd, Sido noticed him and called out, saying, So you came after all. Re walked past him, saying he had no intention of cooperating. Sido apologized saying he wanted to discuss a money issue. If you agree to carry the luggage, you'll receive 100 million yen, Sido offered. Returned and demanded to see the luggage. They arrived at a place filled with backpacks. Sido pointed to them, explaining that he wanted Ri to deliver the cargo to his comrades. Ri examined one of the backpacks and asked, Just 100 million for delivery? What's in it? Sido said it was food. Ri opened a backpack and found it filled with food. He pulled out a candy bar and asked, Candy bars? Sido explained that the guild master loved them. Their camp was on the fifth level, deep within the earth test dungeon. But the conquest was taking too long, and his squad was running out of food. Re smirked, sensing ulterior motives. You're willing to pay 100 million just for food delivery? Couldn't you find someone else instead of waiting for me? Sido wished he could claim his guild was simply generous, but Re was right. They had already sent 39 groups to the fifth level, but none completed the route. Re asked if the earth test had changed from how it was in the game. Sido observed Re and realized this man knew something. He explained that the dungeon's design remained the same, but no one could reach the dungeon's depths. Those capable of doing so were already there, waiting for supplies. Sido suggested that Re might be the only one who could reach the guild master. Re grabbed a backpack and commented on the guild's lack of manpower. But since he was getting paid, he saw no point in complaining. He turned around and asked if delivering the cargo quickly would earn him extra pay. Sido smiled and said he would check on that. Re wondered how much he could earn from this guild. Sido returned after making a phone call and informed him that if he delivered the cargo within a day, he'd receive an additional 50 million yen. Re grinned, pleased with the news. He turned toward the gate and boasted that he could do it in an hour, not a day. Later, on the third level of the earth test, two people stood before a massive monster resembling a praying mantis. The creature swung its claw, delivering a powerful blow, but the young man blocked the attack. His body shook under the strain as he shouted to the woman beside him, You need to leave now. The girl behind him asks, What about you? The guy smiles and says, I'm grateful to you for everything, but you must leave quickly. The girl starts crying and calls out loudly to a guy named Michael. Suddenly, Re rushes past them, swiftly defeating the monster with his sword. He casually says, Get out of the way. I'm in a hurry. Pieces of the monster's body fall to the ground, terrifying Michael. He stands up, relieved, and says, We were saved after all. The girl thanks Re and says that he saved the life of her dear comrade. They notice that Ri has already run far ahead, leaving them surprised. Ri continues sprinting through the dungeon, wondering if the monsters are finally finished. After some time, he reaches the fifth level, running through a long cave before stopping abruptly. Checking his watch, he notes that only 42 minutes have passed and remarks, I even finished faster than expected. Easiest money of my life. As he turns, Something catches his attention. A guy nearby asks, Are you the one sent by Sedsan? Re sets a large backpack on the ground and replies, You're probably from the Wings of Creation Guild. I brought the provisions. 
Where's the person in charge? The guy responds, That's me. I already transferred the money to you. He adds that said San was confident Ri would complete the task quickly, so they didn't wait. Ri opens his app and sees a transfer of 150 million yen from the Wings of Creation Guild. Smiling, he says, they actually paid the full amount up front. I'm always happy to cooperate with them. The guy then turns to his guild members, announcing that the food has arrived. The members eagerly start unpacking the provisions, expressing their relief. You're our savior. We thought we'd starve here, they say. Observing their situation, Ri comments, You guys look pretty rough. The guy agrees, explaining that they lost many members during the conquest. Suddenly, a group rushes back to the camp, gasping for breath and shouting, We have to run! They're coming! A loud scream fills the air, forcing everyone to cover their ears. They see a large cloud of dust rising nearby as a swarm of beetles flies toward them. Re recognizes it as a swarm. Suddenly, powerful streams of fire shoot past him. Shocked, he turns to see Sakino, standing behind him with a sword in hand, unleashing a devastating attack that incinerates several monsters. Re thinks, that's the secret technique of the elementalist class, Flame of Destruction. I didn't know anyone had already mastered it. Tsukino crushes a beetle and greets Ri warmly. I'm glad to meet you. Thank you for taking on a mission from our guild. Introducing herself, she says, I'm Yamagata Takino, the guild master of Wings of Creation. I hope we can continue working together. As she approaches him, Ri senses her strong aura and braces himself. However, unexpectedly, she trips and almost falls. Laughing, she apologizes, saying, I haven't eaten in so long. My legs can barely hold me up. Looking at her guild members squabbling over food, Ri remarks, I heard you were running low on provisions, but I didn't think you'd be starving. They enter a tent, and sitting at the same table, Ri asks, Are you the strongest in your squad? Sukino, while eating chocolate, agrees and explains that although she's the weakest among the ten excellent ones, she's still ranked among them. Ri raises an eyebrow and asks, What's that? It's a strange name. Blushing, Sakino slams her hands on the table and defends, It's not strange at all. The ten excellent ones are the top ten players from the game, and the government gave us that title. Curious, Ri asks, Top ten players? How did the government know about your powers? Sakino explains that U.S. intelligence gathered data on the strongest players, though they never identified the one ranked first. She adds that the ten excellent ones are sponsored by their governments. Re wonders, government sponsorship? How much do they pay you? Sakino replies, it depends on the country. In Japan, it's about a million yen. Hearing this, Re thinks about the million yen he received earlier, feeling frustrated. It's because of people like this that I became a gambling addict and almost wasted my life away. He considers whether he should continue hiding his true identity as number one to avoid attracting trouble. He comments, the reward for passing the earth test is much higher though. Sakino agrees, explaining that while sponsorship isn't significant, the real money comes from those who know about the game. No one has yet defeated the dungeon boss. Ri asks, even being one of the top 10 players, you can't defeat the boss? Sakino admits that while she's strong, she's still just a regular person. If she had the level and equipment of her in-game avatar, maybe she could manage it, but under current circumstances, it's unlikely. Standing up, Ri says, I see. I've completed my mission. If you need more help, just name your fee and we'll talk. With a determined look, he leaves the tent, thinking, now it's time to defeat that boss. I can't earn a billion yen by doing nothing. Tsukino abruptly stands up and calls after him, wait, I'd like to defeat the boss with you. Her guild members protest, what are you saying? We can handle it ourselves without him. Tsukino sternly reminds them, Did you forget my decree? Any hostile actions toward him will be punished. I understand your concerns, but I refuse to lose more people. They recall a previous fight with the boss. Tsukino had struck the monster's leg with her sword and used the hellfire skill, but it barely scratched the creature. Injured guild members had desperately called out to her, warning that their defenses were broken. Tsukino had ordered a retreat to avoid further casualties but one member had refused, sacrificing himself to hold the monster back. 
That loss still haunts her. Back in the present, Sakino declares, I believe that, together, we can avoid heavy losses and restore balance in Japan to honor our fallen comrades. Her guild members listen quietly, hope rekindling in their eyes. Reinterrupts smirking, that was a touching speech, but you can stop now. I can defeat the boss alone. Sakino looks at him and wonders, what kind of conceit is this? But if he's truly number one out of the ten great ones, could they be wrong? How will he fight in this battle? She needs answers to these questions. She follows him out of the tent and asks, You said I could ask for your help, right? I'm ready to hire you to join our group to conquer the boss. Re smiles, turns to her, and thinks he smells money. He asks, But it seems you need more than just defeating the boss, right? Sukino acknowledges that the request is exorbitant and says they are willing to offer compensation for the inconvenience cost. Ree's eyes light up as he asks, Compensation, you say? That's amazing. Ten million from each member, and I'll agree. But first, they need to pay in advance. Second, they must tell no one about what they see in this battle. Those are my two conditions. After all, you want everyone to survive, right? My job is to defeat the boss and save your soldiers' lives. That's where the price comes from. Sakino, smiling, agrees to the terms. Concerned members of her guild call out, telling her to reconsider, but she raises her voice and firmly declares, Listen to me carefully. We're going to conquer the boss, and we will all help secure the victory. Prepare to move out. Re watches them and thinks, Ten million from each member is a lot. How wealthy is this guild if they agreed so easily? Sometime later, they all march together and stop when they see a swarm of flying monsters heading their way. The guild members panic and ask how many monsters there are. Re draws his sword and says he can kill them all for an additional fee. Sakino, while casually eating chocolate, replies that she can handle it alone. Intense flames flare up around her as she laughs and declares that she won't let them interfere with her negotiations. Using her fire whirlwind skill, she scorches the area and defeats many of the monsters. Ri is surprised and thinks she's doing a good job. Her guild members are impressed, commenting that it's what they expect from their leader. Tsukino sheathes her sword, the flames vanishing, and asks if they are ready to move on. Ri glances at his phone, amused, wondering, did this woman eat chocolates just ten minutes ago? He then announces with a grin, I've already received the advance. Let's go take Japan's test. They all move forward, determined to clear the dungeon once and for all. Later, while others battle monsters, a guild member questions Tsukino's confidence in Ri, considering how much they're paying him. He expected more from Ri's combat skills, noting that he only uses basic attacks. Tsukino responds that it's not entirely true, he should notice the defeated monsters. Despite no visible wounds, they are dead, which proves Ri's skill. Watching Ri's moves, Sakino thinks, he doesn't even bother dodging, and his attacks certainly aren't flashy. I wonder what he'll do in the boss room. Sometime later, before entering the boss room on the fifth level, Ri stares at the door and thinks, I haven't seen this door in a long time. One of the guild members shivers, and a girl next to him prepares to use healing magic, asking Ri if he's okay. Sakino steps forward and orders the group to press on. She draws her sword and reminds them they must avenge their fallen comrades. Once the door opens, they need to unleash their most powerful attacks. She and her guild members charge in, shouting as they rush toward the boss. The system identifies the boss as the Sinier Spider, the fifth level test of Earth. Tsukino and her guild unleash their skills, Hellfire, Fire Fist, and Phoenix Fury, causing a massive explosion that engulfs the monster. They cheer, thinking they've succeeded, but Ri calmly states that it's not over. The monster is still alive. Tsukino stares in shock at the gigantic spider. The creature retaliates with a powerful strike, sending several members flying. Despite taking multiple hits, the spider is unscathed, much to everyone's astonishment. Tsukino asks, aren't insect monsters weak to fire? Ri, unfazed, replies, you're right but your power is too low to deal significant damage. The spider shoots webs at Sakino, who barely dodges in time. She warns the others to avoid getting caught, as escaping the web would be difficult. Nearby, Re grabs two guild members and leaps away from an incoming web attack. 
After landing, one of them apologizes for being a burden, retells him not to apologize since their deaths would mean less money for him. However, if they continue to act recklessly and get into trouble, each rescue will cost them an extra million. The guild member blushes, muttering that it's extortion, reconsiders prolonging the battle to earn more money but realizes the guild is connected to the government. Pushing them too far could create problems for him later. He uses his Eye of the Soul skill and observes that the condition for obtaining a soul fragment from the guild master is unusual. The system lists the condition as forcing the bearer to experience the greatest surprise of their life. Deciding to take a risk, recharges toward the boss. Channeling a tremendous amount of energy into his sword, he slashes off one of the spider's legs. The creature glares at him with its huge eye, preparing to strike back. It attacks with a powerful blow, releasing a bright energy blast. Tsukino covers her face from the dust and yells his name, thinking their last hope is gone. But before she can finish her thought, she hears Ri's voice asking, is that all it has? Did it really think it could kill me? He stands unharmed, having blocked the attack with one hand. The system reveals he used the fortitude skill, requiring any soul fragment of rank E. The shocked onlookers wonder how he survived and are amazed to see him single-handedly holding back the boss. Re lifts the massive spider, spins it around, and hurls it aside, leaving a deep mark on the ground. He then rushes to the monster as it eyes him from its stomach. Gathering energy, he identifies the weak spot and strikes the creature's belly with a powerful blow. Energy surges through the monster's body, and the guild members celebrate, believing the boss is finally defeated. But Re, unamused, warns them, Why are you celebrating? The battle has just begun. Red smoke suddenly billows from the wound and the guild members gasp as the boss undergoes a transformation. The spider's huge eye closes, and an intense energy surge follows. The creature stands taller, having grown even more massive. It now balances on two legs, while Ri calmly observes. He explains that the senior spider has two stages, with the second stage being far more dangerous. The guild members are horrified, asking why he didn't mention this sooner. Ri responds with a smirk. What difference would it have made? He activates his soul thread skill, wrapping the thread around the monster as he leaps into the air. A huge magic circle appears, and the system allows the activation of soul incineration, requiring level 40 and several earrank soul fragments. Sakino, realizing the danger, orders her team to take cover. Re utters the word blaze, and the monster is immediately engulfed in intense flames. It screeches in agony while Sakino watches in awe, realizing that Ri's fire is far more potent than hers. She wonders, did he really succeed? Ri stands calmly in place, staring at the monster with a serious expression. The excited guild members cheerfully tell the guild master that the fight is over and, fortunately, no one was hurt. Suddenly, they notice something unusual and exclaim, pointing, look at that, it's a huge block of precious stone. While valuable items often drop from enemies, they've never seen a gem of this size come from a boss. Re raises his hand to stop them and warns, don't go near it. The guild members are outraged and ask, is he kidding? He took a ton of money from us, and now he wants to keep the loot for himself? The gem starts to move, and Re calls them idiots. Watching the scene with a calm expression, he explains, the boss of the earth test, the obsidian spider has now transformed into a vermilion spider. This is its perfect form. The guild members, in disbelief, shout, Are you serious? It's still alive? They fall silent as the monster begins to attack. Tsukino and her guild members are stunned as the creature casts a massive area spell, lifting several people into the air. Tsukino leaps up, noting that the monster's area attacks have become much faster and more powerful. While she dodges with magic, some of her guild members are caught by the blasts. She looks at them with concern. Re rushes over and tells her, If you want to survive, you can't afford distractions. You need to get your squad out of here. Tsukino chases after him, calling his name and asking what he plans to do. He replies, Isn't it obvious? Effortlessly dodging the monster's attacks, he declares, I'll handle this boss alone. Tsukino is shocked and asks, What did you just say? 
As she tries to comprehend his ability to evade the barrage of attacks so easily, Re explains, In this phase, the boss attacks indiscriminately and won't stop until every player in this room is dead. You should take this chance to escape. Dodging is one thing, but defeating it is another. Re strikes at the tentacle the monster uses to attack, but his blow doesn't leave a scratch. The monster seems pleased, making triumphant sounds. Re retreats, thinking, just as I expected, even the hellish dagger can't harm it. He jumps high toward the monster, deciding to aim for its weak spot. Activating his soul reserve skill, he's surrounded by intense energy. Meanwhile, the guild members hide behind a protective dome, asking each other, What is he doing? Doesn't he care about his life? Re smirks and thinks, This should work. The monster attacks with its tentacles, piercing him in several places. Re clenches his teeth in pain and screams, startling Sakino and her guild members. She calls his name loudly and rushes to help him. Despite his injuries, Re calmly looks at the monster as blood drips from his wounds. Laughing, he taunts, You fell right into my trap. The monster, surprised, stares at him. Re then unleashes his soul slash skill, sending waves of energy that tear the monster apart, reducing it to large gemstones. Exhausted but triumphant, Re begins to fall back to the ground. He hits the ground hard, kicking up a large cloud of dust. Looking at the system window, he mutters, I knew this would hurt like hell, but if I don't get healed soon, I'm done for. The system warns that his soul reserve has only three seconds left. If he doesn't recover his health within that time, the soul's protection will vanish and he'll die. Several healers rush to him, pointing their staves and casting various healing spells. Ree stands up and, feeling his wounds rapidly healing, says, Thanks to your support, I didn't need to use my own skills to recover. Your healers are top-notch. Sakino, still processing what happened, asks, So you planned this from the start? Ree grins and replies, Of course. We all play Prophecy Online together, right? A player doesn't die easily from a regular boss attack. The guild members are shocked and exclaim, What's wrong with him? Tsukino, deeply concerned, argues, This isn't true. We're in reality. This isn't a game. Re nods, I get that, but the same strategy worked in the game. So I figured it would work here. And it did. Tsukino stares at him in disbelief, wondering, What is this guy even thinking? The system notifies Re that he has met the conditions to receive a fragment of the soul of a rank D swordsman, forcing the bearer to experience the greatest surprise of their life. 